pray. In the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> We sang those last two verses. Okay. <laughs> I waited on purpose. Yeah, there we go. There we go. I ran across a story uh, this past week. I thought it was interesting. I don't know if it's an apocryphal story or not. It's presented as, as it could possibly be true, but it's pretty far fetched. Uh, it supposedly comes out of uh, Oklahoma. And so, uh, well, maybe it could come from Oklahoma. Anyway, this uh, elderly fellow came back to his apartment uh, one night, uh, evening. And found out that it had been burglarized. And so he called the police. And the policeman comes by and starts to take his report. And he starts to, he was writing down all the things that had been, uh, were now missing. And had been taken. And he gets to the end of the list. He says, you know, i got to tell you one more thing that's missing. And the policeman says, hey, what's that? And he says, well, it's a, it's a one-armed orangutan. <laughs> Oh. One armed orangutan? Are you? No, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm serious. It's a one armed orangutan. And so now the policeman is saying, okay, is this guy pulling my leg? Or is he wacko? Or is this, is this true? Who could it be? And uh, so they're talking about it a little bit more, trying to get clarity. And all of a sudden, in one of the neighboring apartments, there's a, there's a, a, a incredible commotion just, just starts up. And, gets their attention, and uh, the policeman says, well, I better, I better go check that out. And uh, what, he, what he discovered was that uh, the few fellows in that apartment, they were the ones that actually burglarized the elderly man's apartment, and they were going through their, their, their stuff that they had stolen. And sure enough, there was a one on the right hand tank. <laughs> what was it once then? They decided to take, take that, that, I guess, pet, I don't know, uh, considered a pet, now, I don't know if you know this, but orangutans are incredibly strong, oh, yeah. incredibly strong. And uh, this is part of what the, the owner said, you know, and if this guy's only got one arm, he has to compensate with his other one, so that other one is even stronger than it would normally be. That's right. Well, they were also, these guys that had burglarized the apartment were also um, not only going through their stash, <coughs> their, uh, the stash they stole it, but they were in the process of getting high on paint, smelling paint. Oh, know. cool. And they said, I wonder what would happen if we, if we let the orangutan get some of this food. Well, they let him, and he just, he kind of lost, he went berserk, and he started just tearing everything up, including them. And so uh, the, the policeman had to get the owner to come over and calm down the orangutan, get him out of the apartment so that the policeman could get in there and arrest these guys. Now, I don't know. If that's a true story or not, <laughs> you know, you, you hear some of these crazy stories and you say it can't be true, but then you find out well, maybe, maybe, maybe it was. Regardless, I share that story with us not only because I thought it was interesting, <laughs> but but you know sometimes we approach our faith as we're, we're just looking to get that proverbial monkey off our back, whatever that monkey may be, whether it's a, a literal orangutan tearing up the apartment or some issue in life that we need help with and that we come to Christ for. But Christ the King Sunday makes the proclamation that he is so much more than that. And I would think that all of us here probably, probably know that, but that's the emphasis on Christ the King Sunday. He doesn't come merely to help us with the problems that we encounter in life, although he does do that, <coughs> and he does give us direction, he does give us answers, he does give us power, but it's so much more profound than that, so much more far-reaching than that. And yet so many, in our, in the, perhaps in our culture, those that are outside uh, of our culture, like, well, Sherry shared about the person that was brought to Christ or introduced to God by a shoebox, they don't know anything. And so they make some assumptions. We start, as I mentioned earlier, we start a new liturgical cheer, a new liturgical year. Maybe we'll start a new liturgical cheer, too. I don't know. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Go along with that. So if somebody has that, so if the Spirit gives you a new cheer, uh, share it with us. Okay. We'll see where, where that goes. But 
So we are starting a new liturgical year uh, next year. We're at kind of a, a New Year's Eve today. And the readings all kind of give us a glimpse of history. It starts in the past, uh, and it comes quickly into the present, but also when we consider everything, it gives us even a glimpse into the future. Jeremiah, remember that uh, passage about the shepherds? By the way, the word shepherd doesn't necessarily mean it's limited to the clergy. We have a knee-jerk reaction to that. Same thing with the word priest. If you see the word priest uh, in the, the Old Testament, while it certainly includes the clergy, but it's not necessarily going to be limited to that. A lot of the context will tell. But it means, in a sense, leadership. And so national civil leadership could be included in that passage that we just read from Jeremiah about how they were not taking care of the people. It wasn't just uh, the, uh, the, the clerical, the clergy leadership, but it was also the civil leadership. But he said there that uh, he was going to bring forth a righteous branch. I don't know if you saw when it's projected, but I believe the word branch was capitalized. That's significant when you see something like that. Also, it ended with the Lord is our righteousness. That word Lord is the, uh, the unpronounceable name in the Hebrew language, uh, Y-H-W-H, sometimes people say Yahweh. It's his personal name, the Lord. Um, there, it's, It doesn't show it up there. Sometimes if you read it in your Bible, it would be small, all, ca- all small, small caps. Okay? And the software doesn't, doesn't catch that. But uh, that's his personal name, the Yah- Yahweh. That was the name that God gave uh, when, he, when Moses was called, and, he, and Moses said, who should I say? I called you. And he said, say that I am. I am that I am sent you. So we, we see that. He was going to bring forth a righteous branch, and the Lord is his righteousness. God was saying, I'm going to become that shepherd. I'm going to become that leader. I'm going to be that one who will take care of you and guide you. But not just for this life, but even thereafter. Now we come to the gospel reading. We only go. It's, it's stra- it seems strange sometimes to me that we go back to Good Friday uh-huh. on Christ the King Sunday. Yeah, no, we, we made reference to the sign above above him here. You know, King of you know, King of the Jews, all that. But it would seem to me it would be something maybe in the end of the Book of Revelation or something. Uh, you know, which we, we could have done instead of the, the reading from Colossians, but it just seems to me there's a, another place or, or post-resurrection appearance might have been uh, appropriate, but, but it was because of his kingship that the death on the cross meets our deepest, most profound, and eternal need. Not just a temporal need, but an eternal need. And so therefore, that work on the cross reached right on into eternity. So we read about that on Christ the King Sunday. And then we come to this epistle from Colossians, which in many people's opinion is the pinnacle of the New Testament's description of the Messiah. Maybe you could say even the whole Bible's, the pinnacle of the whole Bible, the description of the Messiah. You could read what we read today from verse 11 down through verse 20 every day for weeks on end and there would still be incredible riches to glean from that from that passage as the Holy Spirit unpacks it for us. We'll just touch it up based on a little bit in, in this particular passage, not the whole thing. Aren't you glad I'd be here and be here for weeks? But uh, just a little bit. And that is verse uh, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. But you notice, first off, it says he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. Do you notice that's past tense? Paul is writing to the believers in the city of Colossae, and it's happened. It's a done deal. It's all complete. Like when Jesus was on the cross... One of the things he said, it is finished, it is complete. There's no more really to be given to bring about this forgiveness of sins. You know, some versions, instead of the phrase domain of darkness, 
use the phrase power of darkness. A little, little bit of a difference there. It may seem inconsequential, but in a way I, I think it is significant. Power, um, the word power often comes from the word that we get dynamite from, okay? And that's, that is actually used a little bit earlier in the passage. Verse 11 says, May you be strengthened with all power. The, the Greek word is dunamis. You hear we get dynamite from it with all power. But this one in verse 13, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. The power of darkness comes from a different word, which means authority. Power that comes by virtue of one's authority. Think, think back to that uh, um, uh, that opening illustration with the orangutan and, and things like that. Uh, let's say that the uh, uh, investigating officer was a little, a little petite woman, a little hundred pound, you know, maybe very good shape, with strong, all that stuff, but in no way could take on that orangutan. Yet she could call on help. This is the other one called on the owner, and the owner would not have had any more power, physical raw power, to control that orangutan, but he had authority by his voice, by the relationship, and thereby he exercised power. And that's the kind of of power, that's the kind of authority, the the domain of darkness that is referred to in in that particular phrase. He has delivered us from us being in under the control of the dark, the dark kingdom. And I'm sure you can, maybe some movies are coming to your mind about things where that theme is played out. The domain of darkness. You know, we can experience that domain in our lives. Maybe if we decide to go out and rob somebody, if we go out and steal. Sometimes we hear the most heinous crimes that are committed. You know, I remember one that was brought to mind when I was preparing for this uh, one of her years ago about some kids. I don't remember where it was. It was here in America. But some kids that lured one of their, it wasn't a buddy, but they pretended to be a buddy to this school kid who was, you know, kind of the one that was always getting bullied, getting mocked. And they pretended to be his friend. They lured him <coughs> out into the woods and then murdered him. Oh beat him to God. death with baseball bats. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? And when they, again, the officers ask, why did you do that? You know what their answer was? Just wanted to see what it felt like. Yeah. Wow. That's all. Just wanted to see what it felt like. Where does that evil come from? It comes from the domain of darkness. And in our experiences, those are the extremes. Those are the extremes. Maybe we can experience it in other ways when we make bad decisions. Have you ever been told by somebody, you know, stay away from him, stay away from her, don't do this, don't do that, don't don't mess with drugs, don't do whatever it might be, but then for whatever reason, maybe I'll, I know I remember that, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. That's a, a revelation that the, the domain of darkness is still working in us to some significant degree. He's delivered us from those, and we don't have to give in to those kinds of impulses, those kinds of temptations. They will come, uh, and even when we do give in to them, those are usually our choices, not so much uh, the, the being led or empowered by the Holy Spirit, but those are our choices when we say, well, I remember what Mom and Dad used to say, but I'm going to do that's That's a choice to be disobedient. So we can experience it in those kinds of ways, but ultimately, through the work of Christ and His work on the cross, we have been delivered from the ultimate destination of the domain of darkness, and that is eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from God. And as we grow in living in that that outside the kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son as we experience that more, then we begin to grow and we grow and we grow to discern more about what is the right decision here. And occasionally, yes, we'll still make a mistake, but those things tend to be less and less frequent. And more and more we find ourselves making more of the right choices and experiencing living into that literal power 
literal power. It says, may you be strengthened in all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. We live in a heaven because we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness, the dominion of darkness, into the kingdom of his son. The kingdom. Transferred us to the kingdom. This is the second thing. What is what is a kingdom anyway? You know, my, what comes to my mind, maybe it comes to your mind, uh, is kind of the imagery of back uh, many, many centuries ago uh, about the whole idea of serfdoms, mm. kings, and, and they had their serfs, they had their slaves. Mm. Well, a king is somebody who has sovereign authority over over a kingdom. And the subjects within that kingdom are indeed are that subject to the king. And so as we have been transferred from the kingdom of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his son, we have a new king. Amen. We pray it every Sunday. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's praying for his rule, his authority, his sovereignty to be manifest more and more powerfully through us, through us who are his children, uh, but also the New Testament does use that term, slave. Sometimes it's translated as servant, but again, if you go back to some of the original language, you can see that a lot of times that more appropriate translation is, is slave. So thy kingdom come. And he pulls us out of the kingdom of darkness, but you know, sometimes... Sometimes we resist. Sometimes we think we know better. Sometimes we just I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Because we don't realize that God has our best in, in mind. You know, another, another little story, you know, that uh, came across was a father driving down the road with uh, his children in the car. And uh, they saw on the side of the road a kitten. And they wanted the dad to stop and pick up the kitten. He said, no, no, we got, we got enough strays at home. Thanks already. We don't need any more. But the kids were persistent and persistent and persistent. And finally, the dad said, okay, okay, I get it. I'll go back. We turned the car around, went back. And, and he reached to pick up the kitten. And the kitten scratched him and fought and fought. Well, finally, he was able to get it into the car. The kitten calmed down. They got it home. And it wasn't very long before that kitten had not been calmed down, but started to become friends with everybody in the house, even the father, who he had scratched. The father was just trying to help him. But yet the cat didn't understand that, didn't know that, and scratched him. You know, in a sense you could say, although this is an oversimplification and uh, and maybe a, a belittling, but in a way, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, Jesus just didn't <coughs> help us, but we scratched him. We nailed him to the cross. We didn't understand. We didn't grasp it until later, just like that cat later. says, okay, these people don't mean me harm. God doesn't mean me harm. When God leads us, he doesn't mean, mean us harm. He has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have Redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Notice that's present tense. He's done this other stuff in the past. He's present now in whom now. As we stand in faith, we have forgiveness of sins. We have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Redemption is the forgiveness of sins. It is the cleansing of the sin within us that makes us able to stand with God, to be with God, to have fellowship with Him day in and day out, just as that cat grew into liking everybody in that family. That we grow. Grow up in our affection. And you know what? It never stops. Isn't that wonderful to think about? I don't believe it's going to stop when we die. When we leave our earthly tent here and we move into the heavenly kingdom... I think our friendship and our joy with Jesus is going to continue to grow. I think it's just, it's just it's, that blows my mind if there's any truth to it. If it doesn't work for you, don't worry about it. But I believe it will. I believe it will. You know, the last Sunday of the liturgical year, once again, 
uh, we look to eternity because Jesus is King of Kings, as our colleague said, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So as we go through life, yes, we depend on Him to get us through the rough spots. It's easy to, to think about Him and thank Him when we go through the easy spots of life. But when we hit the rough spots of life, that's a little bit more of a challenge. You know, there's a lot of people out in the world that think that Jesus is just a crutch. He's still here. Jesus is just here for people who need Him. Uh, Newsflash, everybody needs Him. That's the emphasis of Christ the King Sunday. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of Christ. So I hope and pray that as we as we wrap up this liturgical year, we go into a new liturgical year. We'll start with Advent, and you would think Advent might maybe we'll start with the with the uh, uh, babe in the manger to a certain degree, but uh, you'll get some references to that. But you'll also get some references to his return because he's coming back. He came the first time to pay the penalty, your penalty, my penalty for sin. He'll come back the second time. When he does, he's not coming back for redemption. He's coming back for judgment. And we will see that in the liturgical season of Advent as well. So I want to ask you again, as I do occasionally, who do you know that maybe you're not sure where they are? Do they understand this about Jesus, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords? Maybe pray for them. If somebody comes to your mind, pray for them. Pray for them every day. Yeah. Maybe pick up some tracks that we've got here that you could give to them and say, do you know why we celebrate Christmas? Do you know the relevancy of Jesus? Do you know that he is King of kings and Lord of lords? And, and who knows? Maybe you'll find out that somebody is trusting on Christ, but maybe for the wrong reason. Paul close to the end of his letter to the Corinthians, first, first letter to the Corinthians. He says, if we, for this life only, have trusted in Christ, we are most to be pitied. We are most to be pitied. So, maybe we could say, who is Jesus to you today? Maybe we could say that to our friends, neighbors, relatives, people we, we meet whenever, wherever. Who is Jesus to you? Maybe go back and, like I say, read read the, the verses of that sequence hymn. Uh, Crown him with many crowns. Even those last two verses, I don't, I don't think they were projected, so I don't know if you heard them. <laughs> but they were powerful. So you could pull out your, your hymnal and look at it and think, is that, is that my vision? Is that my <coughs> understanding of who Jesus is? Because he's whipped it all. He's whipped it all. And there's nothing, not only in this life, that he won't help you with. But get you to home, get you heaven, get you to home in heaven for all eternity. And that's where we really, we really give thanks and praise Him. Father God, we thank you. <coughs> thank you for sending your Son. Thank you that He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that He has triumphed. And and it's a done deal that we have been transferred out of the, the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of His sovereign rule, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of joy, the kingdom of love and forgiveness through his work. Father, help us to, to grow into more of a knowledge and understanding uh, of the, the kingship of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And just rejoice. And may that rejoicing spill out into the lives, lives of those who are still in the domain of darkness they might catch a glimpse of the light, of the joy, of the freedom, of the redemption that we experience and we know, and the power that comes through the presence of Christ within us. May they be drawn to the Jesus they see in us. Thank you, Jesus. It's all in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.